Thanks, Jerry. I'll try to uh, keep this brief and get to the, the main part of the show. It's uh, great to be here again at RIU, and many thanks to the Vertical Events team for putting on such a great conference. Today, we want to touch on what we see in the market. I'm sure you're all aware of the record number of IPOs that have been reported in the press, and know that you know, the numbers have been records. What we'd really like to share with you is things that, that don't hit the press, the things that actually come across our desks. What we'll briefly touch on today is what's happening with exploration activity, uh, M&A, a look at some of our views on commodities, and then onto ESG, which no doubt you've gathered from Catherine's uh, introduction she'll speak about. As you may have seen from past R RIUs, we undertake an analysis of the quarterly cash flow statements lodged by explorers, and we've got a bit of that data ahead of the release of our report of the, uh, the December quarter. And firstly, on to the number of companies lodging 5Bs. We hit 740 companies, with much of that increase actually occurring in the back half of the year. And I can certainly say that we've never seen a, a six months like it. It was certainly the busiest our office has ever been, um, and it was really around that IPO activity. What we've historically seen, though, is that the December quarter is treated quite cautiously. For capital, you know, for capital raisings, if you miss that pre-Christmas window, then it does take quite some time for capital markets to come back. Many years we've seen around December there's a plateau or a dropping off of expiration expenditure in, in that December quarter. And what we can see is that this certainly was not the case this year. We've had four consecutive quarters of growth in expiration expenditure and the 974 million spent or 973 million spent in the December quarter was the most we've seen since we began our analysis in June 2013. So what's this data telling us? Well, quite simply, the market's very optimistic. Companies have the confidence to deploy their cash and the investors are backing the IPOs. So certainly on the investor side and the company side, there is a great deal of optimism. Um, and we've, we've seen that not only in IPOs, but also secondary capital raisings. We've also seen a trend with a number of spin-offs and there's many companies that are focusing on their primary projects, they're well cashed up and advancing those, and then they've undertaken a listing of their secondary project to provide dedicated funding to that project, enabling investors to choose which commodity they maintain their exposure to. And that's often um, you know, created quite a lot of value for the company and for new investors. So what's our view for 2022? Well, I can assure you that we have plenty of IPOs in, in progress at the moment. I've got one that we're trying to lodge this week. It possibly was going to be today, but it looks like tomorrow now. So, um, you know, there's a lot that we're getting inquiries for. So the companies and the brokers certainly have the confidence for, the, for at least the next six months that the market's not going away. It's predominantly exploration related, but we do have a range of other sectors we're seeing too. So, um, you know, capital market conditions are quite good. I can also tell you that many explorers are cashed up. And we expect high level levels of uh, exploration activity continue, perhaps only impacted by personnel and equipment issues. So certainly, uh, you know, a relaxing of the borders would be welcome news to many in the room. What we've also seen is um, via a publication that BDO does globally called uh, Horizons. It's a, uh, a global M&A publication. And what I think is really interesting in that is the non-mining M&A and the heat chart we're seeing in that is showing that in materials and industrials there's a lot of activity there. So there's some global demand that's been fuelled by the move to greener technologies and also stimulate uh, from economic stimulus that's driving demand that will lead to flow on demand for commodities. So that is really underpinning again another data point to underpin our view that this 2022 year should be quite optimistic. Touching on, on mining M&A, um, and I'm sure that Canaccord mentioned this in their presentation at the start of the week, we expect to see an uptick in M&A going forward. Um, what we have seen is the level of experts reports we work on had really dropped off. Um, we'd really switched over to IPO work. And a lot of those experts reports are around, uh, you know, providing an opinion for funding transactions that are driven by necessity. What we've seen with the M&A activity that has occurred is it's through a, a um, you know, properly conducted marketing process. It's not a, uh, a desperation transaction. And according to market data um, from Global Data, 
uh, they reported that 84%, there was an 84% increase year on year from mining M&A, so quite a, a healthy increase. Again, that reaffirms the, the confidence we're seeing in the market, but we do caution there may be some short-term shocks, um, and really that's going to be driven by geopolitical issues and other unforeseen uh, factors. Um, if we look at what we're seeing in mining services, our uh, M&A team in that space is very busy. There's a lot of in expressions of interest there. Um, so we think, again, another reaffirming data point, and we expect that to, to be a fairly hot space. Um, and really, there's a lot of demand there trying to find people to deploy on projects. If we then turn to, I guess, our views on commodities, what we've you know, been talking about over the last few RIUs is really a push to um, you know, green technology, sustainability, and what we've really seen emerge over the, the last few periods is that the, the gold interest has dropped off a little bit. Oil and gas has made a real exodus, and we've then seen you know, gold come back for some fundraising, but a lot of lithium, cobalt, other battery-related minerals, copper, nickel. So, you know, there's a few examples on the screen there where that's the theme that's coming through, where the money is actually deploying to. So we really think, you know, a key takeaway uh, on the commodity front is that there is a sustained push into decarbonisation. It's not going to go away. Um, there will be long-term term support for these, these minerals. So whilst there might be sh some short-term shocks, we think there's a, you know, a very strong case um, for each of those commodities and really what you all can look for in the short term is where you do get supply demand imbalance in those particular commodities. Um, there was a lot of talk from uh, commentators about gold potentially coming off with the Fed pot potentially in increasing interest rates. However, I think that has been overblown a little bit um, and we are seeing that um, there is still some, some appetite for gold and particularly with the geopolitical risk that we continue to see. But realistically, the main wave that we've seen is around ESG. Um, and to give you more insight on, on that, I'll hand you over to Catherine Bell, who can run through what companies need to be taken into account, and it will give you an idea as to why we invested that in that in our business too. Thanks a lot, Adam. So right now, for most companies, there is a growing business imperative to address sustainability. You know it, you feel it, it's everywhere. All companies' material risks are broadening and becoming more complex with the realities of climate change, global health pandemics, social inequality, and rising industrialization. These mounting risks are seeing global movement emerge driven by capital markets, governments, community, and various stakeholders calling for transparency and accountability across ESG to better understand the impact of business and industry on the environment and our societies. The vernacular terminology and even the meaning of sustainability has changed over time. For business, we've seen it evolve from corporate so social responsibility, which generally refers to the practice and policies of a company um, that a company adopts to promote positive impact, to ESG, environmental social governance which is a metric-based reporting process that promotes the ongoing process of assessing, monitoring and improvement. Right now, this ESG metric basis is being supported by reporting frameworks. Right now, there's probably 3,000 out in the market, um, which is rather daunting and making it very difficult for the capital markets to understand where companies and how to compare apples for apples. The good news on that front is that they are converging and we're hoping to see in the next few years uh, a standard uh, ESG uh, global standard which will be supported by the IFRS Foundation and the International Sustainability Standards Board. So there should be more um, clarity around how companies can measure, monitor and improve with regards to their ESG. So some top uh, ESG considerations for explore, exploration companies. Um, reporting and disclosure is really all about accountability and transparency. It's the tool that's being used um, to help capital find its way to businesses who operate responsibly and to address global issues such as the energy transition. The one that's probably most concerning for everyone in this room will be access to capital. 
ESG screening mechanisms are being placed on every financial institution and, um, and institution everywhere. So as part of um, being uh, uh, processed for, for uh, access to that capital, um, you will have to be able to demonstrate your understanding, um, respond to your material risks on an if not, why not basis. Uh, social licence to operate, um, you're all extremely aware of this. It's been around for a long time in the mining industry. I think what we're looking at here is a version 2.0. Um, essentially, it's just an enhanced version of where this, um, rather than qualitative, they're looking for quantitative and qualitative responses to across these ESG risks. And part of the, and part of what this, I guess, ev evolution of social licence to operate is really understanding that you can't look at E, S, and G in silos anymore. They're all interdependent, interrelated, and interconnected. The third point to make is you're being rated. Uh, global uh, ratings agencies are scraping uh, your data from websites across and rating you. So the more information and the more um, uh, structured uh, kind of active management around your ESG that, you, that you're investing in, the more the positive score you'll have. So the ratings uh, is, a, is a murky area at the moment because they do uh, have different methodologies in the way that they uh, measure and, uh, and rate you. But as far as from a, from a proactive point of view, um, this is something you can play a role in uh, to help improve your ratings and, and where you're seen in terms of your maturity across ESG. Uh, the f fourth point here is really around something that we're seeing that's coming across our desk. Uh, we have a, a remuneration and reward uh, team and uh, increasingly so they're being um, approached around linking uh, board and remuneration to ESG goals. Um, the reason for this is, is, is again, it's uh, providing confidence to the market that ESG is being taken seriously within the business and that it is being integrated into the business and that there are KPIs um, applied to seeing that, that this is actually getting driven um, throughout the business um, continuously. Uh, we're here really to help uh, companies like yours either start your journey or, or improve on your journey. Um, many are uh, in, in Australia, we're a bit of a laggard here, um, are only at the beginning of their journey and trying to understand what you need to do. Um, it can be confusing to start with, but what this is sort of a simplistic diagram in terms of how we really get um, companies uh, activated and understand what their ESG baseline is to then go on to improve and uh, and I guess the, the key point here is that ESG, just like your financial reports, it's data. And so the more data that you can collect and understand around your non-financial uh, business, uh, the better. It provides more levers in which you can control and create corporate value. And also um, it just helps with understanding um, new opportunities. Uh, as Adam did mention, you know, we are undergoing a, a massive transformation of our energy systems, our global markets, and, uh, and, and companies are looking at new business models, uh, collaborations to ensure that there is, um, a, a, I guess, resilience in your business to survive, particularly what's going to happen in the next 10 years as we decarbonise um, the, um, the globe. hard enough. So in conclusion, I have some top tips. Um, ESG is going to remain a dynamic area for the uh, foreseeable future, so it is not going away, so it's better to embrace it now rather than uh, ignore it. Um, it's best to remain agile in that sense. Um, aim for having a clear and concise ESG strategy. Start to view your ESG and business strategy, strategy as one of the same. Having systems and governance that embed ESG into your business will ensure you're not leaving anything on the table. Many of you are probably doing some really great things and there is value in communicating those activities as part of your broader purpose and strategy. ESG is data, as I mentioned. Ensure you're capturing it, monitoring it and improving on it. Actively manage your own narrative. Don't be managed. Be focused on the opportunity rather than a tick box approach. Look for partners, collaborations, 
even your competitors. Where can you have a positive imp impact? Think outside the box. ESG and sustainability is here to stay, and in time, once firmly integrated, it will be business as usual. So the sooner you start, the better. Thank you.